This footage shows a massive fire inside a chemical production plant. This facility is host to a large quantity of a particularly noteworthy material. What you are about to see is what happens when an uncontrolled fire finds its way into containers of rocket fuel chemicals. This is merely one of several explosions. <laughs> Ammonium perchlorate is an oxidizer used in solid propellant rocket boosters. It is unstable and highly flammable. In 1988, there were just two producers of ammonium perchlorate in the United States. Pacific Engineering and Production Company of Nevada, or PEPCON, with a plant in Henderson, Nevada, and Kerr McGee, located just one and a half miles away. At this time, ammonium perchlorate was being used for rockets and submarine-launched ballistic missiles and NASA's space shuttle. This is important because in 1988, the space shuttle fleet was grounded, stemming from the 1986 Challenger disaster. This led to PEPCON storing a large amount of excess ammonium perchlorate on behalf of the US government at their plant. The government had contracted the production of the material and owned it, but with the space shuttle fleet grounded, they arranged for PEPCON to hold onto it for them. As such, there was an estimated 4,500 tons of the product stored at the facility. On May 4th, 1988, a fire broke out in the PEPCON plant. What exactly caused this fire is debated. The United States Fire Administration stated it likely began during repair work to a fiberglass structure in the plant. Workers were welding a steel frame when the fiberglass caught fire and the flames quickly spread. The US Department of Labor and the Division of Occupational Safety and Health discounted this theory as unlikely, saying the exact cause was unknown. Regardless of what caused it, workers in the plant were now faced with a fire. They attempted to put out the fire, but it quickly spread across fiberglass panelling. Very rapidly, the workers were in the midst of a fire that was beyond their control. The plant had to be evacuated. At the time, PEPCON employed about 130 people, but only about 80 were present for this incident. As workers are running from the plant to their cars and driving away from the area, PEPCON's controller, Roy Westerfield, is faced with a conundrum. He is in an emergent disaster. Putting the safety of others above that of his own, he elects to stay behind while everyone else runs out. He calls the Clark County Fire Department. Suddenly, there is an explosion. It is only a small detonation, but it will not be the last. Plant manager Bruce Hawker is ushering workers out of the building and to their cars. With so much ammonium perchlorate being stored in the facility, it is not enough to simply leave the building. Everyone needs to get as far away as possible as quickly as possible. A broadcast engineer servicing a transmitter on a mountain about two miles away starts to film and captures some of the subsequent explosions, the sound taking about 10 seconds to reach him. In total, there were seven explosions in the plant as the fire ignited explosive chemicals and ruptured the underground gas line. The largest of these explosions registered a 3.5 on the Richter scale and was equivalent to a quarter kiloton of TNT, about the same yield as a tactical nuclear weapon. It is one of the largest domestic non-nuclear explosions in recorded history. At the plant, Bruce Hawker is killed in the blasts. He was near his car at the time, perhaps about to leave. Roy Westerfield is vaporized. There is nothing left of him for responders to find. The explosions are still occurring as firefighters are making their way to the Pepcon plant. The shockwaves blow out their windows, showering them in broken glass. Escaping workers fleeing in the opposite direction warn them there could be follow-up explosions. The injured firefighters make no attempts to approach the fire. There is nothing they can do. A five mile radius around the plant is evacuated. The explosions completely level the PEPCON plant and the neighboring facility. Damages are recorded up to three miles away. The nearest residential buildings are 1.75 miles away. Cars are flipped and destroyed. Buildings are damaged. Windows are shattered. Many are cut with broken glass, especially as so many near the plant were in vehicles. People in their homes were peering out their windows after hearing the first explosions, unaware that they were about to be sliced up by subsequent blasts. Even a passing 737 is rattled by the shockwaves. Henderson resident Pat Rose is 2,000 feet from the plant when a four-pound rock smashes through his car window and lodges in his skull. 
he is left permanently disabled. He is one of over 370 people injured by the Pepcon explosions, but amazingly, there are only two deaths, Bruce Hawker and Roy Westerfield. After the fires die down, there is an ugly legal aftermath. Pepcon had $1 million insurance, which led to problems when damages exceeded $100 million and left insurers badly out of pocket. They tried to shift the blame onto their gas supplier, stating the fire was caused by a leaking gas line. This evolved into a legal war amongst dozens of corporations and insurance companies. Tens of millions of dollars were spent on over 50 law firms involved in the case. In 1992, it settled out of court with payments of $70 million. Insurance companies received a further $3.8 million from the county after evidence came to light of some questionably lax regulation and inspections. Some testified that it was only a matter of time before a disaster occurred, considering the state the plant was often found in, with Pepcon seemingly unconcerned that dangerous materials could be found lying on the ground. Instead of rebuilding at the Henderson site, Pepcon relocated to Utah, further disrupting the lives of their workers and was renamed Western Electrochemical Co., or WECO. In 1997, there was an explosion at the WECO plant that killed one and injured four. And so ends the tale of the Pepcon disaster. The footage of the event is awe-inspiring, a truly terrifying display of destructive power, and we only have it through coincidence. A broadcast engineer just happened to be at the perfect vantage spot at the time. Without this coincidence, this footage it would probably be very hard to comprehend the scale of this event. Actually, it still is, as we vicariously watch from the mountainside, explosions two miles away filling the screen. We can only imagine what it was like for those on site, those who spent their last moments in a fleeting world of fire. <laughs>